this is where we're getting to the much more difficult um, what I would like to call level two scouting um, level two scouting uh, tactics. I mean, level zero was what we did the first five weeks, and that included things like uh, micro, which you do on your own, macro, which you definitely do on your own, uh, and just things like knowing your units. Those are things that you didn't have to know your opponent at all. You didn't even have to look at your opponent. All you do is look within your own base and maybe look around the map. So those I would consider level zero scouting. So from then on, in week six, I believe, we did scouting. And from then, uh, we were able to introduce our level one scouting um, tactics. That included scouting itself. In order to, but scouting spawned uh, our ability to form correct counters, to harass, and to uh, just basically know what our opponent has and where to position our army. Position our army However, now we get into more of real game theory with uh, level 2 scouting, where you know what you know, you know what your opponent knows. Now, you have to use both together to determine what you have to do next. So you have to both read yourself and your opponent in order to decide what your next move will be. Um, kind of a dumb analogy, but kind of like second order differential equation, uh, because uh, not only do you have to mind all uh, the derivatives, but you also have to mind the second derivative, and they all have to add to up together to be some With army detection, you can use your um, you can use what you choose to, to display to your opponent to cause them to move their army to a weaker location. And this could um, this could be one of two things: um, drawing your drawing your their defensive army away. to attack in an incorrect position. <clears throat> of course, we remember that one very silly game by Sonic, where he blocked off someone else's base, and then um, he really, really grew their, uh, their offense to attack in an incorrect position. <coughs> I mean, of course, then he followed up with cannons behind afterwards. But that's beside the point. Uh, the point is that he was able to and we'll see some examples of that in real games today, and not silly games by Sony. <laughs> and the second type is, is build order deception. So when you see someone's build order, you um you force them to make units, or actually uh, you cause them to make units that you um uh, that are incompatible with countering what you have. So let's say you um, you pretend to go lurker to some sort, and then your opponent will obviously start making um, making cannons or bunkers or attacks in front of their base, and then you suddenly switch to do this, and then you start attacking the back of their base, where it's on the other end of the Oh. This also includes that one very, uh, very genius game by K uh, by Casey versus July, where we saw Casey start mining from a different base to cause July to uh, to think that uh, Casey went for a different build order. And that build order caused July to make more drones as opposed to more defense, and then subsequently July lost the game very shortly afterwards. 
Um, so like our comments, we're like, oh, we'll see examples of these things. Okay, that's the only way to um, to view them more properly. Okay. So a very elementary form of um, uh, deceiving your opponent is to make your opponent think that you don't have forces where you do. Um, so we're going to take a look at uh, these lurkers. All right, so lurkers have this extraordinary ability to not attack. Now, why would not attacking uh, be very be helpful in any situation? I mean, all through semester, we've always talked about attack the most number of times uh, at the most uh, for the longest amount of time to deal the most amount of damage. So, how does not attacking help anything? Do you want the enemy's army to move completely on top of the lurkers? Exactly, splash. Um, with splash damage, your lurkers can deal much more. Uh, you can deal much more damage to more units uh, in a short amount of time. The amount of time that it takes doesn't really matter. It's the full amount of damage uh, that that, that uh, it takes. So a common tactic that uh, Terrans will use is to send a couple units out, and if those units die, then there were lurkers there. If those units did not die, then there are not lurkers there. So it's quite simple. And not only that, but Terrans also are very smart. They know exactly how many uh, units the opponent should have. I mean, uh, we talk about scouting. We talk about the realm of um, uh, we know what. What the opponent could have. So, if you sense that your opponent doesn't have something or is missing something completely, then you'll know that um, then you'll know that uh, something's missing. You should be more cautious. Maybe scan more. Or something. So we see how we have this example. Here we see our uh, parents doing their little trick, saying, "Oh, how come my brain is not dead?" And it's very, very important. Sorry. It's very, very important that, uh, okay, so the Marine here did not die to these two lurkers because they were on hold. But it's very important that he did die to those two lurkers up there. Because this causes the parents to think that, um, that the main force of lurkers is up above the ramp. And why wouldn't he? Because above the ramp is where it's best to defend, and above the ramp where it is, um, is where you should put all the lurkers, and so those Marines will never get up that ramp. However, we see that's not the case here. As you move these marines up, but the Zerg is not satisfied with just killing one group of marines and medics. Um, I'm bringing two groups of marines and medics. And not just oh, that, um, he uses those mealists to draw the marines and medics forward because mealists are very expensive. And so, and they die quickly to marines and medics, um, as we've discussed before. So he draws the marines and medics ever uh, forward, and these, uh, and these lurkers, they cause um, massive havoc on these units. So, um, with the so, two things were very important there. He had his um, he had his lurkers up the ramp, and he had the lurkers in front on pole. <clears throat> so, um, so what you see the Zerg has actually done is he put himself in a weaker position, um, because um, because logically no one would ever put himself in a weaker position. So the Zerg was in a place that his parent did not expect. We'll see a, another example of the Zerg putting itself in a weaker position. So this is uh, called willpower hold lurkers, and you'll see where the willpower comes in in just a moment. And thanks to Wolfpack um, over here for sending me this brief uh, this blog. Okay, we see right here that uh, the Terran is coming with a huge army. That's at least four control groups of Marines and Medics, but fit the supply. And then he comes in on this map of uh, attacking these different colonies. Um, so you see that these lurkers are on hold and not firing. So again, the Zerg has put himself in a weaker position, and the Terran um, would uh, the Terran would obviously think that no um, no Zerg would uh, would ever put themselves in a weaker position as opposed to a stronger one. But just in the last something called the fallen, we see the spikes of death pop out of the ground. Alright, so this is. I don't know if we can see who that was. It's like the enemy versus C1. It's the So actually, there's another effect in play that um, that people might or might not be thinking about. That um, when pro gamers play, when very good players play, 
they don't actually look at their armies. I mean, um, because once they determine that they won the battle or lost the battle, or once they know the outcome of a battle either way, um, and they know that they don't need to micro anymore, they can stop microing. So, um, what ha probably happened was the Terran saw his attack was uh, well underway, yeah, and he's probably kind of puzzled at why the Zerg did not have any other forces in any other area, but he was content with taking down those four sons for possible future uh, harass or run by us, of course. So, I moved another screen, he went back to macro some more, and then before he knew it, um, um, it, all the Greek medics were dead. He realized that himself, he didn't even scan. That must have meant he did, wasn't on the appropriate screen to hear or see his uh, Marine Medic die. <clears throat> so that's actually something else to think about, is when your opponent is, um, is microing, when your opponent is not microing. <coughs> so both of those cases, um, <coughs> <coughs> both of those cases were examples where, the, um, uh, where one player was able to draw his opponent's army out of place because of something unexpected. Um, one player, well, in, in both cases, actually, the Zerg was able to predict what the Terran was going to do, um, and then, and then placed units, and placed uh, thing, uh, placed units, and had look at the hole in such a way to cause the Terran to think that there was nothing there, but in actuality, well, you saw the result. <coughs> Um, oh, this one was amazing. Um, I guess I won't talk anymore about this since uh, Doctor's awesomeness speaks for itself. Yeah, 
took of a hitchhiker is just uh, doomed to fail. However, okay, so the truck does see the lack of gas. So the truck, mm -hmm. the truck obviously thinks that the chair is supposed to build some very, very weak build. <clears throat> so the Protoss, uh, on the other hand, have chosen, oh, I guess that was it. The Protoss went to a cannon and two zealots, and those two zealots weren't even attacking anything. So that uh, delayed his economy by a lot. So by uh, by revealing a certain build order, of, <clears throat> by revealing a certain build order, Upman was able to fool his opponent into making his economy weaker than it has to be. Of course, you realize again that in this, in this situation, Upman made himself weaker first because he knows that oh, everyone knows that two barracks will not stand up to um, let's say two gateway celebrants or uh, uh, two gateway tribunes. And so he made himself weaker first in order to cause his opponent to think something, and then switch all of a sudden with um, two factories, siege tanks of uh, um, siege tanks of vultures and uh, two gates. Um, I don't actually know the outcome of that game, but uh, just that very beginning, <coughs> the Protoss did um, have a substantially weaker uh, open. <coughs> he needed gas. What? Yeah, he although oh he did need the gas. You know that's a very good point. He need gas made factories, believe it or not. He need, uh, also need gas made um, to make machine shops and um, and tanks and to research things like siege and mines. However, if you saw the very end of that um, of that tiny tiny little clip, I wish they had more. Uh, you saw a command center pulling out to his expansion, so the the train was able to take a substantial early economic lead and get two gases. So with two gases blazing, he was able to get his two factories, two control of uh, machine machine shops, and deliver goods to pump out of them. I'm going to guess it was tanks because, well, probably tanks and some vultures, but uh, in any case, all magic would have been in a, in a superior position because of uh, the problems of late, uh, late tech and the way of the time. So in this game, um, it's actually uh, quite a good game, I think. <clears throat> and it's oh, sorry, question. Um, yeah, you said the Protoss is a tank of mines with a cannon. Yeah. But he only made um, the gateway to his new cannon. Yep. Two zealots and a cannon. Yep. Um, whereas the Terran had a second barracks and at least a few marines. So. Um. Well, we could put it this way. The Marines would have been there anyways, uh, because if if a couple of dragoons marched down their uh, march down the lane, it, uh, hitchhiker, hitchhiker is actually kind of small map. So if those if dragoons marched down, um, those you would have had to have Marines before you got the tanks. And um, up that you got extra barracks, that was his loss. But he did get an expansion. Uh, he got a bunker and a barracks and an expansion. So that was something the Proton was completely not prepared for. But then couldn't the couldn't the Protoss have Um, it's possible, I guess, to expand up his own ramp. I mean, there's a there are expansions up Hitchhiker that are uh, behind the ramp. But the uh, the thing is, uh, the important I guess the important thing is one, he made those zealots, and those zealots did not attack. Those zealots didn't put any pressure. If um if if the Protoss had realized his folly sometime soon, he, what he probably would have done is try to run those um, zealots past the bunker and mm -hmm. cause some harass uh, and do some damage there. But the thing is, those zealots were 200 minerals of dead weight and the cannon. And don't forget the forge, too. Um, because most Protoss don't build forges. So that's about 500 minerals that didn't do anything think for of, a good amount of time. Think of it as like a one barracks into expansion build, except with just an extra barracks. You spend 150 minerals for an extra barracks and force the Protoss to build forge, cannon, zealots, gateways, all kind of crap, overreacting to what he did. And then he ended up with an economic lead in the long term. Do that anyways if you're going back to the main thing. Yeah, that's a good point. Really necessary to get points So now I'm going to see a game, Isle of Wu against Zerg 1. Uh, this, is a, this is, I think, um, Isle of Wu at its. Even though this is Isle of Wu not at its very best, <laughs> um, this demonstrates the, the brilliance <coughs> and um, the, the ability of those, these top ranking players to be able to psych out their opponents. I mean, we know. 
Okay, we know that uh, Boxer in his later days resorted to uh, all sorts of cheeses, all sorts of things like new brushes and all uh, random crap like that. Um, it was probably because he wasn't able to keep up with his younger counterparts in terms of m macro and whatnot. However, he was um, he did have a brilliant and analytical mind, and he was able to psych out his opponents, kind of like Ida Blue does here. So this game is uh, is on a map called Destination. Um, on Destination, uh, it's a two-player map, so each player knows exactly where the other one is. Um, <clears throat> and Ida Blue decides to go. Um, use this SCP to go block off the ramp. Um, so, so, I mean, the thing about Terrence blocking off their own ramp is that it's, it's sometimes a sign of weakness because it, um, because, because it, I mean, it allows them to uh, build fewer units uh, to defend early on, but it also means that the, the, the SCP that goes to build it and subsequent SCPs that go build things near the ramp um, cost a, a Terrence some, or some minerals. I mean, take uh, at least, um, at least 36, or if not 42 minerals, to get 36, no. What's the 40, 40 or 48 minerals? Wow. Uh, 40 or 48 minerals to get the SCB out there because of the mining it, um, it did not do. So soon afterwards, um, he builds this barracks here and uh, goes in his gaps. Um, of course, at this point, um, I mean, at, at this point, the desert is going to come along and see that gas and see the uh, see the wall in. <coughs> and then, um, and this is not the part um, where I love who demonstrates his uh, amazing deception just yet, because um, this is fairly, uh, I mean, it's standard now, but it was starting to be, uh, become standard back then, just before fantasy came up with his famous fantasy build. So at this point, uh, with the with the parent being able to deny the um, being able to deny the scouting attempts of the uh, of the Zerg very well. The Zerg has you no know, has no clue what his Terran opponent is going to do. At this point, the Terran can either go one more barracks with the academy, um, a factory with vultures, or more factories with vultures and goliaths and whatnot, uh, or tanks to break the uh, break the sunken colonies in front of the Zerg base, or he can go uh, starports and uh, with rings. In any case, in any case, the Zerg does not know what uh, what the Terran is going to get, and we see here. Um, one of the more standard responses to um, to fast gas um, is a hatchery. Uh, it is a, a third hatchery with a hydrolysis stem. A third hatchery with a hydrolysis stem means that the Zerg is able to get some hydrolysis, which deal explosive damage, uh, while terrible against marines and medics, uh, do significant damage against um, vultures and tanks and wraiths. Uh, as we've heard commentary from before, uh, wraiths are kind of like paper airplanes. They get shot straight out of the sky, um, by <coughs> So here we see Oop starting a star form. <coughs> um, of course, the Zerg has no way of knowing that, so we, I guess we fast forward to a little bit later to see what the star form can do. <coughs> ah, this is very interesting. Oop has gone to the academy uh, after uh, going to star forms. What this means for us is that Uv is trying to transition back to a, uh, to an M and M build, and at this point, the Zerg has no clue what's he gonna, what he's going to do. And once he reveals that rate, uh, the Zerg is probably going to assume something like um, one or two port rate with or without float. And we see here the port of uh, the star port is uh, is making, and uh, I believe the uh, second barracks is going to come really soon. Anyway. It's going, to, it's going to come really soon. Is it not smart to assume that you've got the academy to start? Um, it's possible, but um, with three hatchery, uh, I, with ha three hatcheries and a hydrolysis stand. Oh, you definitely can start it there. Okay. Um, well, I mean, well, well, one by the time the wraith gets there, he'll know there's a den, okay. or he'll see the hydrolysis stand. But and also by the time the wraith gets over to the general area. He'll also know that the, the Zerg has a lair, and um, and frankly, there's nothing mm -hmm. to break down that wall that the Zerg can build right now. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean he needs to get a scan. He's basically not at the cost of 200 minerals and 50 gas. Well, yes, uh, the, only, uh, the scan is just an added benefit. It's, it's great. 
And so now we were thinking control power. Um, control power means one of two things, dropship or, um, okay. So here, ah, this is very interesting. Um, Marines of uh, Wu has revealed the fact that he has some substantial force of Marines and Medics. Not just that, he's revealed his Medics and his Fire Bath, and I believe he's also got Stim there. Um, Black is talking very loudly and very quickly. In, oh no, Cholera is talking very loudly and very quickly in this, I don't want to turn the sound down. Um, but I believe he also stimmed there. So he revealed to the Zerg that he got um, he got strong um, um, medic and marine forces. <clears throat> but of course, the strong, uh, a very strong counter against that would be Mutilus, which will at once hit the raids and the marine defenses. But we will see very soon that Wu's um, extraordinary build is able to throw the um, throw the Zerg even more off balance. So we see here that the Zerg has decided to go mutilus because uh, pre-hatch mutilus with all that gas stored up all the time into making nothing but Zerg and hydrolus is going to be very strong. <coughs> and also, when you have a spire, you can make um, you can make scourge to stop stop any possible dropships or rates that all uh, get in your way. <coughs> so we see here some harass by um, Wu. This isn't um, this isn't boxer level harass. Um, even though Wu is boxer student, but it's harass enough. However, this harass is very important though. This harass means that the um, that the Zerg can't leave his base with, with the Tigerless. So even so by revealing the fact that he got these marines and medics um and getting cloak at the same a uh, cloak for his race at the same time, he's able to to thoroughly confuse the crap out of the Zerg. In, uh, and the Zerg won't know where to go. Whether he goes mutilus, in which case he'll face cloaked raids um, with slow overlords and no no real detection, or to go mass hydralis, which will fall under um, under mass marines and medics, or to go mass zerglings, which will fall under mass uh, hydr uh, mass fire bath or marines and uh, medics anyway. So in this uh, scenario. So in this case, we see that the um, Zerg is thoroughly confused and has chosen uh, chosen a tech, uh, I mean, it's chosen a uh, form of tech, and that it's not working out. <laughs> I mean, uh, he'll get the overlords for um, Wu's base eventually, but uh, as we all know, so, uh, overlords move. You know, if overlords and reavers had a had a race, no would there be would be there to watch the finish. <laughs> And so now with um, now with an armory and rates and academy, Marines, medics, stim, range. Um, <laughs> essentially Uva has gotten just about every single tech option open to open to Terrence and is using his tech advantage to well, at once confuse the Zerg and second to um, to switch any way he wants. As Cholera so brilliantly puts it, um, Uva's kind of playing like a Zerg and beating a Zerg in his own game with his incredible tech switches that can um, that's beating whatever the Zerg has to offer at any one point. So the rest of this game is um, is Uv demolishing the Zerg because he has a, a full two base tech, like a, a two base with full tech against um, against the Zerg who at the same time has two base and full tech. And uh, we know that uh, the Terran must the Zerg must uh, completely <coughs> out expand the Zerg to have any chance in this game. I mean, this is good grass, but those operators are um, really making this out of those out of those fields right there. So that's enough of this game. But um, you'll see how, and this is how by revealing certain things, by telling your opponent certain things, um, you're able to force him to do um, make poor decisions. <clears throat> and um, we can see in this game that um, who did make himself weaker many times. He started off by walling, then he got academy and. Um, and stim um, for for all of like five guys while, while then going back to um, while we're going back to cloak race, which um, and all these tech switches made the Zerg confused as to what he could actually get. <coughs> <coughs> so that's enough of this game.
Um, the rest of the series, which is the um, which is the 0809 MSL prelims, these prelims are the ones before the um, MSD. Uh, I mean, these prelims are like 20, are eight, no, no, are 24 groups of eight that have to play each other to get out. Uh, unfortunately, even after demolishing Zerg Boy in this game, who ultimately loses the next two games, um, I think because he was just not innovative enough. He uses the same build three times. Um, and Zerg Boy reacted properly the next couple times. Uh, the proper response is getting hydrogen faster and uh, just just not minding uh, Mutilus at all. So that way he could still deal with the Marines and Medics by focus firing them and also deal with any possibility of any factory or air I mean, I can't, oh my God, I can't say that's the correct response, but I can say that Zerg Boy did use that. He ignored, um, um, he ignored um, Spire altogether and then he won. I think that is that much of a Um, and just for our dicks, we can watch this game. Um, this is a game of Boxer versus Yellow. As we know, um, Yellow has always been second to Boxer in every respect. And, and, um, this, and, and in ingenuity, of course, that is still true. This game is on, on, uh, on a map called Blade Storm. I <coughs> like doing Yellow. Alright, this map is called a map called Blade Storm, where, where there is um, um, expansion, a base, right behind your main base. Um, and I guess you can see how this plays out. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> so, so the drill's tracing over all this step and going back through every single pace he's looked at just to go, to go find Boxer. <laughs> But he's like, where is it? Since so many of you are doing replay analysis, uh, analyses, and I expect these replay analyses to be good, um, you guys, um, I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet for um, for the and let's see how many. Okay, I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet, and you guys can sign up for which days you want to present your replay analyses on Thursday, the 30th of April, and Thursday, the 7th of May. All right. Um, so you guys can sign up for that. What? Else you, can you, can you can um no you don't have to sign up for anything, and uh, you can submit your papers on Team Liquid on the seventh of April. Oh okay. uh, May May seventh. Sorry. Um, I'll read them online. Just make sure I know who you are. <laughs> Um, and also, if you guys would for me, uh, could you gra also grab a piece of paper, um, or if you don't have paper, I guess I have um, uh, And And you've all been in this class, and I see all of you, I mean, most of you have been here for every class, and, and thank you for that. Um, write how we could have made this class better, and how we could have improved this class. I remember at the beginning, uh, everyone was complaining about how much math there was, and not enough, um, not enough gaming. And, and um, in the second part, I tried to put in more of that. And so I guess your input will determine what the, the next semester's um, StarCraft students are going to encounter. <coughs> and well, this and, and I know these. Um, I know these. It's probably best if these um, these uh, course like evaluations are are anonymous. But I'm going to use them to take both. 
But I won't hold against you. It's for a kind of anyway. Right. Is he with those names? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
uh, recently, no. <laughs> this was back back in the day where timing was much more public than Macworld. Mm -hmm. So back back then, so like people didn't play like Macworld mm -hmm. until like later on. I mean, they had a boom and do like the Macworld fans and stuff, but but still back then. Like, Last week was looking for a replay. Uh, all right, so last week we were talking about how to convert your um, the maximum APM you can have into something uh, into relieving yourself of be, of having to defend against um, against drops or whatnot later. So for someone who moves as fast as let's say boxer, <laughs> um, he's able to uh, mine up this position instead of um, when the protocol recalls in instead of having to um, instead of having to say oh crap. He's recalling in. I better mobilize all my forces. So we see this. Um, this is a map called Ride of the Valkyries, and then there's these big. Uh, you have your base, and you and both bases exit up. But in each base, there's a big lump, um, kind of towards your opponent. And this lump is excellent for placing things like supply depots, but also excellent for dropping. So, um, I mean, um, so we see we can see what happens here. Uh, the boxer has obviously scouted uh, any time um, arbiters, so and he knows that uh, any time is going to go uh, recall of some sort. So we see this very neatly, very nicely placed uh, array uh, arrangement of mines, and we can see them uh, later. So boxer probably spent you know uh, 50 action, uh, 50 actions or so, or let's say 10 seconds or, or so, uh, placing these mines. Ah, what do we see here? No, we see tanks sieging us. So um, we know that if the arbiters um, arbiters recalled into there, the mm -hmm. siege and the splash from all those units around um, would uh, demolish this, uh, this recall before it began. So Anytime knows that too. So he chose not to recall there. And in any, in any time of mine, this actually is a very smart move because um, <clears throat> because. Uh, by forcing Boxer to siege there, it causes Boxer to take even an even longer amount of time to be able to respond to whatever's going to happen in his base. However, Boxer did have um, tricks up his sleeve too. Uh, Boxer had a whole bunch of turrets all ringing his entire base, so no observers could get in. And just for a bit, there's a, 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 a turret in the middle of nowhere also. That um, all those uh, the turrets, sorry, uh, all those turrets got rid of any observers that might be in the area. Without observers, any time you would have no clue that there are so many mines in the area as well. So by preemptively mining all these on um, this entire uh, area, uh, Boxer was able to uh, defend against a, a whole recall with like 70 supply worth of troops in his base with relatively few actions. So, uh, so he could get on with whatever he was doing. Uh, let's say macro or something like that. Yeah, I, uh, he, he eventually loses. I mean, any time he comes up with something like this. Uh, where is it? Any time, okay, this is like a minute. Okay, this is like three minutes after the initial battle. And any time, oh, really already? Okay, I guess it's both of them messed up. Okay, so here we already, this is, um, Two minutes after the begin replay, so it's only been a minute since the uh, that terrible recall, and we already see any time is max again. So, um, so you see the, the extraordinary importance of macro, um, not to you know diminish Boxer's amazing play with the observers. Actually, another comment on the um, recall thing: like a lot of times, the pair players do, or this is Sherman told me this is what he does. So he kind of like turns a huge area and then leaves one spot open. Just for arbiters. It's like, you know, arbiters come this way and recall right here. And, <laughs> and it's like a landing strip, but the landing strip is full of mines. <laughs> so that's what, that's what he does. He's a lot like game versus like, you know, like JS or some people like that. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, just like on, like, Aaron, just name like a couple of maps that are like, they're really good for recalling. Like Blue Storm is one of them. And Domino. Everyone know what Blue Storm looks like? Yeah, in, the, in, the, in Blue Storm, there's all there's another section of your base that's basically dark most of the game until someone recalls an army there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like yeah, basically any time you have a base that has um, like a big base. Ah, uh, there we go. 
like a really big base, but like you only build in like one section of it. It's like a big ten This is so. any times macro. Even though he lost his like his, his entire army of boxers based to those two lines, well, he still made another army. And then after he loses this one, he makes another army. And then you know, boxer, boxer loses later on. Yeah. So that's why why expand why attack when you can expand, you know? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so you all signed up for this class when the class was named um. The class was named um, Game Theory and Application of StarCraft. Um, believe it or not, we're going to attempt to do some Game Theory here. So in game theory, um, you essentially examine what your opponent does and what you do, uh, given a set of rules. I mean, in our case, game theory is um, game theory for us um, is what you do and what your opponent does, given the set of rules in StarCraft. So there's one very significant aspect of um, game theory that I'd like to expand upon, and that's signaling. In game theory, there mu um, so there's a certain number of assumptions. One, there must be a message in whatever mess. Uh, there must be a meaning in whatever message you send. So if you do some crazy dance and no one gets the message, then uh, there's no point. I mean, we see like honeybees or whatnot do these intricate and awesome dances, but you as a human will have no clue what it means, but other bees do. So whatever signal you send must have a message. Two. Each player must maximize his utility, including the center. <clears throat> okay, so um, so this isn't as big of a uh, it isn't as big of a thing in StarCraft since there's only two players. Um, you always maximize your utility, anyways. And also, since StarCraft is a non-cooperative game, uh, as in when your opponent uh, you you cannot ben you don't want to benefit your opponent in any way. <coughs> so, um. So we can assume that each player uh, maximizes his utility anyways. Something, I mean, um, to go to actually talk about game theory, something, um, a game that would require cooperation is something like maybe Settlers of Catan, or maybe uh, a one on one on one in StarCraft, where there's multiple parties, not just two. You have to maximize your own utility. And you also have to assume that all your opponents are maximizing their utility too. So you can't have some uh, raging opponent who Really wants vengeance on you, and in a in a in a free for all, just attack you. That's not maximizing anyone's utility. Actually, maximizing everyone else's utility. And finally, <clears throat> the third assumption is that there is some cost in signaling. Because if there is no cost in signaling, then you can you can send as many signals as you want, and you, um, that would well, one overwhelm your opponent, and your opponent have to sift through what all, what all these signals mean. So there must be some cost in your signal. In all the cases that we've seen so far, the cost of signaling has been uh, has been delayed tech of some sort. In <clears throat> in up magic's, in up magic's case, he had to spend an extra 250 minerals on a bunker in the barracks. In um, in Oob's case, he spent um, an extra academy, a uh, stim, and uh, academy and stim. That was quite some. And I mean, in every case, we uh, we saw um, in the boxer, even in boxer's magnificent uh, fake drop. He had to send a free dropship down, uh, 100, 100 minerals per gas, just plain wasted down that, down that way. So there must be some cost in sending the signal. <clears throat> um, and applications of game theory, as we see in nature, let's say, are things like peacocks, bird song, or, uh, or uh, babies asking for, uh, and infants asking for nourishment. Uh, in, in, I mean, if you take the case of peacocks, all male peacocks with their enormous feathers, they um, they they put themselves in a slightly worse position by uh, by sending their messages. However, their messages do have some do have some meaning. It demonstrates their virility. It demonstrates their ability to mate, which attracts more, uh, which attracts teammates, and uh, passes on to their team. That's actually that's a very simple 
That's a very simple, um, uh, that's a simple application <coughs> of signaling game theory in, uh, in nature and in Qbox. And the same goes for bird songs and, um, and infants. When infants ask for nourishment, um, they're attracting more predators to, um, to the nest, den, or home, or whatever, while at the same time, it guarantees their own survival. And also, uh, by max, and of course, the mother would want to maximize her utility as well, because she did carry these, um, these infants for some amount of time, and uh, she did waste her resources carrying these infants. And so, um, she wants to maximize her utility, she wants to maximize her return, the most um, number of her being passed on for the resources she gathered. So what can she do? Well, feed the infants and shut them up. And so I guess uh, bird songs do the same thing. They demonstrate their virility at the same time all attracting predators to their generation. However, one uh, piece of, uh, one signaling example is especially important to us. And that is called, um, and that is a, a certain movement called stalking in gazelles. It, uh, it's spelled S T. S T O T T I N G. Essentially, I mean, what do you see on what do you see on the um, uh, what do you see on the African plain? You see, um, you see lions, lionesses, let's say, hunting gazelles, let's say. So when the gazelle notices a lioness trying to eat it, it will jump like ten feet in the air. Okay. Um, so basically, by the gazelle by signaling to the lioness that it is, it is fast, it is strong, it is agile, it is demonstrating to the lioness that it is not worth it for you to come chase me, to chase one of the weaker uh, gazelles. So this at once, <clears throat> this at once saves the gazelle, um, saves the gazelle, uh, saves the gazelle um, resources by not having to run away from the lioness. It also improves its own chance of reproduction because the lioness could eat some other um, some other gazelle that wasn't so lucky that could not stop. So in this case, we see, uh, we see how signaling at, at a cost to the gazelle itself by jumping like 10 feet in the air and providing real and true information to his opponent was able to save himself resources. I mean, in this case, it's actually, um, it's almost a cooperative game between the gazelle and the lioness because the gazelle gains something by, um, by not having to run and the line that's gained something by not having to run too, or but just by simply um, just simply chasing down a weaker uh, gazelle. Now we have to ask ourselves, um, why does this work? Well, this works because let's say a gazelle who is not strong enough to perform this task, uh, who is not able to display its immense strength uh, or agility or whatever, would be chased chased down by a line that's ten feet easy. So, um, so you. Have so essentially, it's like a call and an answer. Um, the lioness calls, and um, and the gazelle answers. If the gazelle answers correctly, then the uh, then the answer is accepted, and there's no um, there's no punishment for the gazelle. If the call if the answer was inappropriate, then the uh, the lioness can choose to um, choose to punish the gazelle for uh, for incorrect response. I know this sounds really really out of whack with what we're doing with, I mean, game theory is absolutely to start now. But this actually has enormous application of in higher level games. Let's, um, <clears throat> actually this, uh, it's a, it's a movement I tried to identify um, called proxying. Okay. Um, proxying, as most of you know it, is, um, is to build, um, build production facilities in, in close proximity to your opponent's base. That's called, that's the usual definition. But what I mean by proxy is to send a small force to your opponent's base, and you can call it harassment or whatever, but small, send a small force to your opponent's base, this is your call, and then you see if your opponent come up, comes up with the correct response. If, you come, if your opponent comes up with the correct response, then the answer is accepted, and then you choose not to follow that path. If the, if the answer is incorrect, then, uh, then you choose to punish your opponent for not coming up with the right answer. Okay, um, again, this is still very theoretical. Think about it this way. Suppose I have, um, I have, let's say, eight speed zealots, eight speed zealots, and I run them straight into your base, okay? What do you do? You can, one, do nothing. You can, two, 
bring some truth in, or can three, bring all your truth in? Okay? I mean, obviously, not if you, if I'm asking these questions right now, you say, oh, I'll just bring some truth in. If you bring all your truth in, then your, your answer would be the incorrect one. And my call, <clears throat> sending the delegates in, would have evoked your incorrect response. And when you sent all your guys in to just fill eight speed delegates, I sent the rest of my 100 supply army to fill expansion, which is worth way more than my supply delegates. <clears throat> it's eight hundred minerals. I can build like either a big piece at once. <laughs> All right, so <coughs> <coughs> so essentially, um, I I would like to call this technique proxy because it's affecting your will. It's affecting the will of your army by proxy. So what's the best response? Well, to reach or uh, to send exactly the number of troops you need to defend against my eight zealots, and, and then it's just a slightly bit, slight bit more. Because it's always easier to defend than to, um, than to attack. And since my zealots are already in your base, you have to, uh, I'm on the defending side, I'm defending against your attacking army against my zealots, while your main army um, still must weather <coughs> a possible full-out attack by my army. Okay, so, um, <coughs> so I haven't, been, I haven't been able to find too many um, good applications of this in pro play, um, but I assure you they do it a lot. I can't find any important ones at the moment. However, I found uh, at least one good one where the call is um, is answered in incorrectly. a fairly short game, and, and in this case, the call is answered incorrectly. So this is Blue Storm, as we've seen many, many, many times. <clears throat> and, um, okay, this is just, I mean, this is harassment. It wasn't so much of um, the proxy play, the call response, but the call and answer that I alluded to earlier. Uh, we see here that these zealots will show up at this, um, at this, this zealot's base. This, um, this grown up face. They're all adults, anyways. Okay. So we see here, this is the call. Whoops. Oh, that was going to be the call. Right there. <laughs> Yellow sent one, del uh, one delegate. Ah, that response was pretty good. Uh, the response was sending one delegate after it. However, the, the problem was, you're just not supposed to send just one zealot after, you're supposed to send two. Because uh, because you can see that zealot uh, dealt some damage there. And since the call was answered incorrectly, yellow now knows that green does not know how to respond against this. Okay? So since yellow now knows that green does not know how to respond, he can go in and um, and cause havoc in the mining line. And here too. Okay? So... This call was also answered incorrectly. He sent his, when he saw he was in danger, he, uh, Green sent his entire army back to defend against these zealots, and that left this side un, um, <clears throat> undefended. And you can see uh, by the length of the game here that uh, because of this event, um, Yellow wins a short time later. Okay, so, so why would either player execute a proxy attack? Well, uh, again, this is the this is the essence of game theory and the call and response, call and answer. Because let's suppose yellow does not know whether or not teal is capable of performing these of uh, performing these maneuvers. So yellow does uh, so yellow is our lioness, and um, so he does not know whether or not he wants to expend the resources to go on the chase. If he if he just dives head in into the, an attack. Then there's a possibility that a teal can fend it off perfectly and then counterattack soon later. Um, so he has to send in a very small investment, in this case one single zealot. If you have a lot of guys, maybe five or eight zealots. Right? <clears throat> so you send in a small investment to test your opponent. Uh, and then, uh, based on the results of that test, 
for the um, you can uh, you can decide what to attack or not. Now, of course, this is very costly to you. You have to send your small uh, small army, which could very costly be demolished completely, and you have to uh, micro that army in, uh, intensely because you have to be at once watching this army to see what kind of response the opponent's going to come up with, and try and deal some damage with this army at the same time. You can't just throw it away to waste. However, with correct application of this, the results are incredible, as you see here, that um, we see that um, the, that Teal was not able to respond. Now, this, just, this doesn't happen just in PvP, not just in this situation. You can think of all sorts of situations for yourself. Let's suppose um, Savior. Remember Savior versus, uh, was it Stork he demolished with dropping four Hydras over and over again? <laughs> so, I see that as Savior's call. Um, um, Stork could have um, uh, could have destroyed that force easily. Why did he send like four zealots, right? And then those four hydras would have died. Four zealots and let's say one um, one dragoon to chase the overlord away, so he, they can't just pop in and out. But Amphis, but um, but Stork was not able to answer the call properly. So because Stork, uh, Savior could see that, he just did it over and over again until Stork died. Okay. And we see this um, in PVT a lot too. A shovel flies in. Um, with low with Dark Templar, he doesn't even have to drop a Dark Templar. He has to um, he has to pay something, and then go towards the Terran. And then if he sees the Terran unseige and siege or cluster his uh, vulture ground in a pleasing fashion, then he'll know that the Terran is capable of performing these maneuvers, and he cannot um, he cannot bully the uh, the Terran into doing anything by dropping Dallas, dropping PTs or whatever. However, if the Terran chose, uh, uh, chose not to, or could not, siege or unseize his tanks, or bring his vultures around, then the Protoss would have free reign over this Terran, uh, over this Terran, and be able to uh, execute this drop um, at will, and whittle down the Terran, uh, Terran army. This also goes for things like storm, um, so various forms of storm drop, uh, I mean various forms of um, darting in and storming something and then pulling back, and stuff like that. So all, so basically the point of this, is um is to have a very low investment to and you pay this to learn something about your opponent. If you can learn something about your opponent, then you can learn whether they can respond correctly or incorrectly. And based on this, you can choose to do it again and again and again to abuse it, or if they respond correctly, to try something else instead. <clears throat> so um I mean that's only I, I've never actually heard anyone else talk about it this way or um explain it this way. That's just my theory. Um, so I haven't been able to find too many great examples of it. I'll try to find more for next time. But we have 20 minutes left, which is um, a perfect amount of time for me to present my example for your guys' final presentation. Because um, most people, like I said, most people chose replay analysis. And, um, and I don't know whether or not you guys know what I expect of you, so I'll give you guys an example. Uh, okay, fine. Father did comment on this, but I think mine's better. So someone said that. Oh, oh, the oh, the SSL. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, SEL was the latter. Yeah, that's alright. Thanks. Do you mean watch the live cast? Yeah, yeah, I watched it. It was a pretty good one. Very exciting. I like the Israel one. Alright, let's see. 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 Let's and um, well, Cloudler commented that um, that the winner of this game would probably go on to win the whole thing, which uh, which he did. Okay, so this game is um, so. What do we know about Bisu versus Savior? Well, we can see that this is the uh, 2007 game, I think. Yeah. 
This is a 2007 game. So we know that this is past the time um, when these two first came to, uh, came to power. His rise to, um, was this his, sorry, uh, his MSL or OSL? Um, I think his first MSL well, was filled with DTs. Um, Isu was able to beat Nal Ra with three Dark Templar rushes. I, I don't know why Nal Ra didn't get um, detection or anything, but um, Isu was able to beat Nal Ra with, um, with three DT rushes. And, <clears throat> and Isu's game against Boston um, in the semifinals um, were, uh, were filled with full speed zealots and DTs and uh, whatnot. But the most important game um, was Visu vs. Savior, and where his where he first presented his famous Visu build. Now this Visu build isn't like the Flash uh, the Fantasy build, which comes into play, uh, which comes in on uh, wild everyone and then fades out of existence as Jadon comes to a halt. This Visu build, as we uh, as we know, uh, as we know, has been around for a long time, uh, and since Visu introduced it, although in various very um, various variations, whether it be DTs or Reavers or in the earlier, in the earliest incarnations, it was DTs, and um, so as Savior, looking out, look, uh, and also, okay, in um, and in the MSL itself, Savior was unprepared for Bisu when he brought this out. So in this game, um, after they made again two years later, um, a Savior is obviously out for blood, and he wants to know the perfect way. Uh, he wants to figure out the perfect way. So what do we know about um, Blue Storm? Well, Blue Storm, um, the closest way, or the closest path between two um, two bases is going to be a very small choke that can that only Zealots, Zerglings, and Hydrolis, well, I mean other units do, but those are the important ones that pass through. And DTs, of course, because he's a high Templar. <clears throat> and the fact that there's bridges everywhere, and you have to make these S turns to get in and out of your base, um, make make the Bisu build ideal. And also, we have to consider, um, I mean, when you're as famous as these people, you have an ego to protect. And you want to be able, you want to use your signature, your famous build, against someone else and to protect them to use it that way. <clears throat> so Savior, in, in, this, in his mind, is probably thinking that Bisu is going to come up with, is going to use his famous, famous Bisu build against him. So he has to defeat it somehow. Well, he knows that the Bisu build uh, has certain stages. One is the Corsair Harass, the second comes the Zealot Harass, um, Mass Zealots, Speed Zealots, or Dark Templar, or whatever comes along that line, the Citadel Templar line. So, um, yeah, this, uh, this pre game analysis is part of the problem. It's not just like this is getting into the Yeah, you, should, you guys should be doing this too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah have to infer you right. Um, and also, this, since this is a best of three, these um, these round of eight games, they're best of three games. Um, so, of uh, delivering a blow, delivering a win right here against the Bisu build will be instrumental in demoralizing Bisu because that way, Saber will have the upper hand in going into games two and possibly three because uh, Bisu will know um, will know right off the first game that his um, his plan doesn't work. Whereas if it does work, it will simply strengthen his resolve and strengthens his determination in this game, in, in, in this build. So, uh, oh, sorry, going on. So what are the weaknesses of the Bisu build, since we're so likely to see it? Well, the Bisu build relies on Corsairs, and what can beat Corsairs? Hydralisks, since Corsairs can't attack ground. What can attack Hydralisks? Dark Templar. So there must be a very interesting balance between Overlords and Hydralisks and getting the Overlord to the right spot. Because usually, these um, because if you send Heartless too early, then that, uh, then that means you'll weaken your economy too much and won't be able to break through the cannons. If you send Heartless too late, the early um, the earliest Overlords that you send through are going to get picked off by Corsair, so the timing has to be very important. Or, you have to figure out a way to get your Overlords to the position, to the combat, in the correct amount of time. So with that, we can start the game. And, and seeing what Xavier has in mind. Uh, so we can fast forward a little bit. We um, we'll be able to see in just a moment that Xavier is going to choose for um, for speed link build with an expansion. Yeah. Speed link build with an expansion. <clears throat> okay. And if you observe the number of drones he has, he didn't go for 
for just on nine full speed. He actually went for, well, I think, over full speed. <clears throat> How, so what do you do with um, over full speed? Well, if you once again think about the topography of Blue Storm, you realize that the, both chokes, the inside choke and the outside choke, leading to your base, are very open. So it's um, very difficult. Um, and so it's very difficult with conventional units to defend those chokes, so, um, which means that um, B2 has to come up with um, cannons of some sort. And um, B2 here has a fork here. So B2 is going to have a fork and cannons to protect his, uh, to protect his uh, base. However, we know from Blue Storm that um, even though Zerkins can even though Zerkins can run through the small gap, uh, it's not very effective to go something like a 5, 6, or uh, 5, 6, 7, or uh, 5, 6, 9, or 11 full all in rush to, uh, to try to kill the Prozog. Because indeed, those chokes are very narrow, and two probes can block the ramp and, gap, uh, and um, gain valuable, valuable time for the uh, for the hands to actually walk in. However, we do see Savior here having stopped um, mining gas. Uh, so we know that he's oh, we know that he is going to go um, some um, many zergings before he does anything else, and this is his attempt at expanding. I'm going to get to this time. Oh, and what do we get? <clears throat> okay, here we are. So we see uh, these two cannons are are respectively designed. I mean, these are designed to kill zergings. I mean, uh, if you just put two probes right here, or uh, or zealot in the probe right here, and maybe put a gateway right here, it becomes very, very difficult for even speed things to run through. And um, or if they could run through, they can have casualties on the way. However, what is the incredible weakness of these cannons? They are in terrible position to defend against any range hyperlips attack. So, um, so that is why Savior went the um the, the speed things build in the in the first place. So by killing the probe, or at, at least denying it from seeing Savior's face, Savior is able to um, is able to stop stop Bisu from knowing what he has. So he could be going 24 lanes, or he could be going just the eight lanes that he's already made. So Bisu does not know and must prepare against um, Zergling. However, the proper way of doing against Zergling is to put your cannons kind of towards the back, so things like gateways and next side take damage before the cannons do. However, that's terrible against Hyrulus, because Hydros can just simply stand out of harm's way, using their range to defeat uh, their opponents. <coughs> <coughs> so we see two cannons and Nexus going up, and which will result in a very strong economy for Bisu. Of course, the next segment of the Bisu build is to get fast Corsairs, and then either Speed Zealots or Dark Templar. And there we see the, um, the gateway, of, uh, and the subsequent units and tech that comes afterwards. And that gateway of the is very good position. Ah, we see this drone. That's a very, very significant drone. I mean, why would Savior send a drone to the middle of nowhere? And watch the minimap. He's actually going here. I mean, if if these was, if, okay. well, if Savior was going for an expand, um, I mean, it's very possible actually. So let's say expand to the top, and then go needles to protect all the bases because needles are very all uh, versatile and can uh, move very quickly. So, um, so if we had seen. Um, Savior expand to the top, we would know that he's going meatless very shortly afterwards. Hyperlips would be completely unviable because um, because they move so slowly and can run around everything, they can't catch up with DP and Corsair is really over there. However, now we see the incredible strength of his speed, uh, speed link. With, well, with links on this side and 